Well, you know, all this is all, frankly, uh, it, it's moot. We don't care who knocked out which. The question is who wins now. And at this point, we are going to kick the shit out of them. We're going to win this, whatever the cost. For the United States of America, the 1950s was a vicious test of democracy. It was, in reality, a fight to keep democracy's influence more powerful than that of communism. During a period in which tensions were incredibly high with Russia, American citizens feared the spread of communism and the threat of other non-democratic countries, such as China, North Korea, and their allies. Out of this tension came the Vietnam War, which began in 1955 and continued for 20 years. The public perception at the start of the war was that the United States was solely involved in order to help the people of South Vietnam. However, as the war progressed, the public began to have suspicions about the government's actions in the war. America's executive branch made many questionable decisions, which heightened the tensions already fermented in a decade of such high-pitched rebellion. Women's liberation, Chicano power, black power, anti-war movement, student protest organizations, gay rights. The discovery of the government's covert actions that continued the war for 20 years resulted in one of the most famous scandals of American history, the Pentagon Papers. Released in 1971, the papers were packed with confidential information about the government's secret actions in the Vietnam War. Consequently, it spread partial hysteria and worry throughout the country, culminating in the press bringing loathsome Nixon and his tin soldiers down. The mind behind this daring expose of government corruption was Daniel Ellsberg, who worked on the top secret study of U.S. decision making in Vietnam with the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, in 1966. By June of the next year, the Secretary decided to proceed with the study. McNamara referred to this study as an encyclopedic history of the Vietnam War. He believed that this written record of the key decisions that led to the U.S. involvement in Vietnam would be useful to many scholars and politicians in the future. The McNamara study staff was given access to McNamara's personal files, memoranda from the White House and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, State Department records, and specially requested information from the CIA. One of the first people recruited to help with the study was Daniel Ellsberg, a former Pentagon employee with six years of Vietnam-related experience. Ellsberg worked on the study focused on the Kennedy administration's Vietnam policy in 1961. In early 1969, the Pentagon Papers study was completed. The papers consisted of 7,000 pages and 47 volumes. The Pentagon officials involved classified the study as top secret and published only 15 copies. Although a historical study, officials worried that information contained in the Pentagon Papers, if it became public, would make foreign governments hesitant to engage in secret negotiations or provide secret assistance to the United States government. The Pentagon Papers revealed controversial actions taken by the Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson administrations. Daniel Ellsberg grew increasingly pessimistic about the chances of the U.S. victory in Vietnam. The options, as he saw them, presented a choice between bad and worse. In 1969, Ellsberg returned to his work at the Santa Monica office of Rand, where he began reading the Pentagon Papers. He read through the secret history of U.S. support for 1950s French efforts to crush independence movements in Indochina. Ellsberg came to see the continuation of the war in Vietnam as not only bad policy, but as immoral. By midsummer of 1969, it became clear to Ellsberg that Nixon had no intention of simply declaring victory and pulling out of Vietnam. Faced with the prospect of a war without end, costing thousands of American and Vietnamese lives, Ellsberg pondered what he might do to bring about a change in U.S. policy. After attending an emotional conference at War Resisters at Harvard College in August, Ellsberg suddenly felt liberated and ready to take action to end the war, even if it put himself at risk. Convinced that release of the Pentagon Papers would make an already skeptical public more likely to apply the pressure that might finally bring an end to our involvement in Vietnam, Ellsberg decided to move forward with his plan. When the public understood how it had been misled by the past presidents, Ellsberg thought they would no longer buy what the current president was telling them now. On September 30, 1969, 
Ellsberg visited the apartment of an anti-war friend of his, Anthony Russo, who shared his concerns about the war and the immoral actions taken by previous presidents. The next evening, leaving his Santa Monica office, Ellsberg slipped a couple of thick volumes of the top-secret Pentagon papers into his briefcase and headed out through Rand's lobby. Ellsberg took the volumes over to Russo's apartment. From there, the two men and Russo's girlfriend, Linda Sine, traveled to the offices of an advertising agency that Sine ran. Using a Xerox machine in the agency's reception area, Ellsberg and Russo began the time-consuming process of photocopying the Pentagon Papers. They didn't leave the office until 5.30 the next morning. The next night, and for many nights thereafter, the copying continued. Ellsberg knew that what he was doing was a crime, and he fully expected the day would come when he would pay a heavy price for his actions. In early November, Ellsberg carried the Pentagon Papers to Capitol Hill where he met with an anti-war congressman to discuss strategies to end United States involvement in Vietnam. Ellsberg told Senator William Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and a Vietnam policy critic, that he had a copy of a secret study that might change public opinion about the war. At Fulbright's suggestion, Ellsberg left a copy of the Pentagon Papers with Fulbright's legislative aide, Norville Jones. The next year, Ellsberg stepped up his anti-war activities. He resigned from Rand, testified about Vietnam policy before Fulbright's Senate Committee, spoke at an anti-war teach-in at Washington University in St. Louis. In late August 1970, Ellsberg traveled to Kissinger's San Clemente office, where he urged Kissinger to read the Pentagon Papers and to reconsider the administration's Indochina policy. Ellsberg left his meeting with Kissinger depressed believing that the lessons of history would not be learned and that there was a little prospect for a substantial withdrawal of U.S. troops. By the end of 1970, Ellsberg was giving serious thought to turning a copy of the Pentagon Papers over to the New York Times. On March 2, 1971, Ellsberg traveled to the Washington, D.C. home of New York Times reporter Neil Sheehan and discussed with him the possibility of turning over to the paper a copy of the Pentagon Papers. Ten days later, the two men met again in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Ellsberg sought to get Sheehan to commit to publishing large sections of the study, and Sheehan said he would push his editors to do just that. After Sheehan returned to New York, a copy of the Pentagon Papers in hand, he and other reporters at the Times spent the next several weeks sifting through the thousands of pages of the report, looking for reports and anecdotes that would tell a compelling story of how we got into the mess that had become the Vietnam War. On Sunday, June 13, 1971, the New York Times ran a three-column, front-page story containing excerpts from the Pentagon Papers. At the White House, Richard Nixon read the story with a mixture of disgust and relief. Although Nixon had said that it was criminally traitorous for someone to have turned over the papers and for the Times to publish them, he was relieved to find that the papers focused on earlier missteps of earlier administrations, not hits. His first reaction was to keep out of it and let the story run its course. But later in the day, a riled Henry Kissinger urged Nixon to take steps to stop publication of further stories based on the Pentagon Papers. As soon as he learned of the Times' impending publication of the Pentagon Papers story, Ellsberg bundled a few things from his apartment and went into hiding. On June 15th, as the Times published its third installment in the series, the Department of Justice filed a demand for an injunction against further publication in federal district court in New York City. After listening to arguments from lawyers for both the Times and the government, Judge Murray Gerfine granted a temporary restraining order against the Times and then scheduled another hearing for June 17th. By June 23rd, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals had decided to send the case to the United States Supreme Court, and on June 26th, one day after granting review in the Pentagon Papers cases, the opening arguments for the case were presented to the Supreme Court. Daniel Ellsberg surrendered to arrest at the federal courthouse in Boston on June 28th. He was indicted on charges of theft and espionage relating to his role in the Pentagon Papers controversy. On June 30th, the Supreme Court announced a decision in New York Times versus the United States, holding that the government had not shown a need for an injunction against publication of stories based around the Pentagon Papers by the New York Times. And also, uh, with the Ellsberg case being the issue, uh, he, he, he cannot take anything. Just say that we've got to keep our eye on the main ball. The main ball is Ellsberg. We've got to get this son of a bitch. And uh, 
And, you know, I was talking to somebody over here yesterday, I mean, one of our the, uh, the PR types, and they're saying, well, maybe we ought to drop the case if the Supreme Court doesn't uh, sustain and so forth. And I said, hell no. I mean, you can't do that. Uh, you can't be in a position of having, uh, as I said this morning, we can't be in a position of, uh, of, of ever uh, allowing, it just because some guy's going to be a martyr, uh, of allowing the fellow to get away with this kind of wholesale thievery, or otherwise it's going to happen all over the government. On December 29th, the indictment was returned against both Ellsberg and Anthony Russo, including 15 counts related to theft of government documents and espionage. If convicted on all counts, Ellsberg faced the prospect of a 105-year prison sentence. The first trial of Ellsberg and Russo came to a sudden halt in July of 1972, when it was disclosed that the government wiretapped a conversation between one of the defendants and his lawyer. In November, the United States Supreme Court, voting 7-2, refused to hear defense arguments arising from the government's wiretap. Nonetheless, in a view of the lengthy break in the trial, Judge Byrne declared a mistrial and ordered a new jury impaneled. On April 27, 1973, Judge Byrne turned over to the defense a shocking memo from Watergate prosecutor Earl Silbert to Assistant Attorney General Henry Peterson. The memo said that Silbert had just learned that Gordon Libby and Howard Hunt burglarized the offices of psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg to obtain psychiatrist files relating to Ellsberg. When it became clear that the break-in was committed by the employees of the White House pursuing a project launched by the President, the basis for a mistrial grew compelling. And on May 11th, Judge Byrne ruled on the defense motion for a dismissal of all charges against the defendants based on the government's gross misconduct. 